bless you, Father. Magnify your holy name. Hallelujah. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, God. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice, I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul rejoices. Take joy, my King, of oh, your devotion I am. And what you hear, what you hear, and what you hear, let it be sweet, sweet, sweet sound. Let it be a sweet, sweet, sweet sound. Father in your ear. Oh, we love you, Jesus. We love you, God. We love you, Lord. And we Take joy, my King. Take joy, Jesus. Take joy, Holy Ghost. Take joy, Father, in what you hear, in what you hear, in what you hear. Take joy in my song, the song I sing to you. Let it be a sweet, Father, let it be a sweet, let it be a sweet. Sweet, sweet, oh, the sweetest sound <clears throat> inside of your ear. I bless you, Holy Ghost. Father, I welcome you in this place. I give you glory, I give you praise, I adore you, I magnify your holy name. I thank you because this is the day, Father, that you have made and we shall rejoice. Be glad in it. I thank you that you have given us life this day. Holy Spirit, I ask you to permeate this atmosphere. Let these words that you speak through me be a source of encouragement and nourishment to all the hearers thereof. Give us eyes that we may see, ears that we are able to hear, and a heart that is not hardened, but one that you have circumcised, that we may be able to comprehend all that you are doing, Holy Ghost, in Jesus' name. Satan, I take authority over you and I bind you up in the name of Jesus Christ. I break down, cast down the mind-binding spirit. I nullify its assignment in the lives of the sons of God. For God has given us eyes and we shall see ears and we will hear and a heart and we will be able to understand God. I cast down that veil of blindness upon the sons of God. No son of God shall remain under the, boat, uh, the yoke, the bondage of the yoke of Satan. In Jesus' name. I bind up every mind-binding spirit. I take authority over the spirit of Jezebel, the spirit of witchcraft. I curse it and cast it down in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, good morning and welcome. I am Apostle Mary Gibbs. Always a pleasure to be with you today. We are going to get right into the Word. Today, the title of my message is... <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> When you are unhappy with God's provision, when you are unhappy with God's provision, our main scripture is coming from Exodus 16 verses 1 through 15. Again, that is Exodus 15 verses 1 through 15. And as always, I read from the New King James Version. The Bible says, the whole Israelite community set out from Elim and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the sixteenth of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, "If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but." You have brought us out into this desert to starve this assembly, this entire assembly, to death. 
Verse 4, Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread, come on, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. What's happening here? The children of Israel have been journeying for a minute, and now they get to a place where something as basic as bread to eat could not be found. Come on. Right, and it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I will rain down bread <clears throat> from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day <clears throat> and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them again. Then the Lord said to me, Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. <clears throat> I rebuke you, Satan, in Jesus' name. <clears throat> The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them. Come on. It's important that you understand the purposes of God. Why does God do what God does? Right? And so we know that God doesn't do things haphazardly. God always has a purpose for everything. What is happening in your life right now, you're looking at situations and you're saying, this is a strange phenomenon. This cannot be happening. But the Bible is explaining to you that when God allows a lack in your life, right, and he provides for you in some way, God is doing something. God is testing you. Come on. The entire <clears throat> reason for the lack and God's provision of that lack is a test. Why? What is God? What is God looking for? It says that. I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. Oh my gosh. I will test you to see whether you will follow my instructions. Following instructions when we have need, when we don't understand, when we're frustrated, when we're devastated emotionally, is very difficult. You know, when you're just not in a good place, you don't feel good, you're not happy. And here is God continuing his testing and you're saying, really? I mean, all right? But when you see lack in your life, God is working something out within you. That lack is purposeful. God doesn't waste anything. He doesn't. Every situation in our lives that occurs, occurs so that it can perform a particular work for God. Everything in creation exists at the behest of God. Everything in creation, except human beings, of course, because of self-will, understand that when the creator speaks it must respond you don't have a choice <laughs> right and so the bible says that god says to moses again in verse 4 then the lord said to moses i will rain down bread from heaven for you the people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day in this way i will test them <clears throat> I rebuke you, Satan. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. Verse 5. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. Verse 6. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Verse 8. Moses also said, You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening, and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. 
While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening, quail, which is, which is like a type of chicken, <clears throat> that evening, quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. Verse 14. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Verse 15. Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. God says, I will test them. When you are unhappy with God's provision, when you are unhappy with God's provision, one of the signs that you know that you are destined for wealth is that there must come a time in your life where you will ex experience extreme lack. <clears throat> if you're a person who is used to having stuff and <laughs> being independent and self-sufficient and money's always in the bank, you're a planner, I mean, one of the evidences to you that you are destined for wealth is that God must take you through a wilderness experience where you experience lack, hunger, unfamiliar terrain. You see, I have often said that we hear the promises of God and we rejoice and we shout and we jump and we're happy. But what I can promise you that is this, that every promise that God gives you comes with a season of testing. As Christians, when we get born again, we have head knowledge of God. We, do, we know God by head knowledge, by what the scriptures tell us God is, by what others tell us God has done for them in their testimonies. But we ourselves do not know God on an experiential level. We know God only by head knowledge. But whenever God gives you a promise, especially one of prosperity, that is to say, you will be blessed, you will not have lack, you will be rich, you will have abundance, that promise comes with a season of testing. The Bible says that we inherit the promises of God through faith and long suffering. Patience, long suffering. We inherit the promises through faith, believing God, and suffering long. Believing God and suffering long are requirements or ingredients <laughs> that are required in the journey you are going to take when God has given you a promise and you will take possession of that promise. When the story of the children of Israel begins in Exodus, the Bible tells us that God told Moses to go and get them, the children of Israel, from Egypt to come and bring them to a land that flows with milk and honey. But they did not know God. And God doesn't take you to your place of promise until you become intimate with God. Until your knowledge of God becomes not head knowledge, but experiential knowledge. Meaning that I know God by experience. The thing I know about God is not what someone told me or what I read in the good book. The thing I know of God about God is what God and I went through are the experiences that God brought me through to reveal himself to me. So when you're looking at your life and you're saying, what in the world? <laughs> God, I, 
this is unreal. How can I go from the place I was financially, the place I was emotional, the place I was health-wise to this place, this desert place? <laughs> what in the world? But your lack, your hunger, your difficulty is about testing. And so, when God provides you with bread from heaven, manna, manna is not the provision that you would have for yourself. No one is going to go out and provide manna for themselves. Why? Because there are aspects of manna that are just not what human beings like. Manna is not predictable. In receiving manna, you have no control over it. All control is taken from you. The only control is in the hands of God. You have no say so when it comes or when it leaves. God decides all of that. Furthermore, manna is unfamiliar to you. You don't know what in the world it is. It is not something you can generate on your own. You've never seen it before. <laughs> it is a supernatural provision. And so, it is uncomfortable because... There is no guarantee that every day manna will be present. God decides if he's going to give you manna or not that day. So how am I going to keep trusting God when today I am hungry, tomorrow I am thirsty? Right? But when we keep reading in the book of um, uh, 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 Exodus 16, the Bible tells us that, indeed, the children of Israel did not do as God said. God told them to go out and gather what they would eat for that day, except on the sixth day. On the sixth day, they should gather two times as much, so that because on the Sabbath, God would not provide any. But the children of Israel did not do that. They gathered the manna, and then they left it till the next morning, and it began to stink with maggots. And God says, disobedience. The same thing happens on the sixth day. On the sixth day, God says, gather twice as much. But yet, some of them did not do that. They went out on the Sabbath day and God did not provide manna. Right? Testing. Whenever God has given you a promise, he must take you through a wilderness experience so that he might test you there. So that he might do what? He might test you there. God does not give out promises, blessings without testing. That's just not the way God does things. And God is purposeful in doing it that way. Let's go to Deuteronomy 8. Deuteronomy 8. And we will, verse 1 through 19, we'll go through, we'll read the whole, um, the whole chapter. Deuteronomy 8, I'm reading from the NIV version. Oh, it was the NIV version I read from earlier. This is also the NIV version. My apologies. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and you may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to do what? To humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. That is the entire purpose of the wilderness experience. <laughs> I need to see, God says, I need to see whether or not you will do what I'm telling you to do. If you cannot obey my commandments, now that you have nothing, when you get to a land where you become puffed up and you become this mighty person of God, this mighty woman or man of God, if you can't hear my instruction now, you definitely are not going to hear my instruction when you get there. Jesus explained some, some, something to us when he was talking about wealth. He says, listen, it is, it is difficult, it is challenging, almost near impossible for a wealthy person to access the kingdom of God. Why? Because 
A wealthy person puts their trust in their wealth and in self. A wealthy person has a form of pride, right? Self-sufficiency, the belief that you are the master of your own universe <laughs> is pride, right? And so in the wilderness, God strips you of your, of your pride, of your, hum of your self-sufficiency, of your independence, to let you know that you are not in control of anything, right? To let you know that you are not your, you are not self-sustaining. You are sustained because the Word of God sustains you. You are not sustained because you sustain yourself. And so you must go through this place where God's provision to you is not something you like or want or even understand. It becomes this place of frustration because God is trying to get you to come out from under your carnal mind and access your experiences through the spiritual, the supernatural, your spirit. And so it says that, remember how the Lord your God, verse 2, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble you, right, to depress you, to strip you of your glory, to strip you of your confidence, to strip you of your pride of your self-sufficiency, your independence. I know it doesn't feel good. Trust me, I speak from experience. It is one of the worst feelings that you can feel. To feel dejected, to feel depressed, to feel humiliated, knowing who you are, what you are, what you're capable of doing. And all the while you ask and wonder, well, is God really with me? What in the world is this? And you want to get out of this place because it feels like a prison and you're not sure if you are going to be able to make it remember how the Lord verse 2 remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart whether or not you will keep his commandments verse 3 he humbled you how did God humble you causing you to hunger when god allows lack in our lives it is a form of humiliation he is humbling us he is stripping us of our self-sufficiency our independence our trust in self he humbled you causing you to hunger so the fact that there is lack in your life is the evidence that god is with you that God is working out a testing in your life. It is not evidence that God has abandoned you. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with the manna, which neither you nor your ancestors has known. Manna is unfamiliar provision. When we are unfamiliar with something, we are not comfortable with it, we don't want it, we are not happy with it. It's like going to a restaurant um, at, you know, that serves international cuisine that you've never had. You're hungry and you just want to satisfy your hunger and for you, you know that your hunger will be satisfied if you can order something that you like eating or something you know. But you get there and they say, oh, they start to name foods you've never had before. And now you have to get used to this thing that you've never experienced before. First of all, you may like it or not. It might not appeal to you. The smell, the taste, the texture might not be appetizing to you at all. But yet, this is the provision that God has given you. And so now you're, you're contending with, should I just starve? <laughs> or should I just go ahead and eat whatever this is? Right? And so when we are in seasons of testing, God's provision does not always make us happy. We're not going to be happy with the provision during a time of testing because that provision will always be manna. Why? Because God wants to work out some things. God wants to use it to work out some things. It is not a punishment. It is just God's way of bringing us into the place of maturity that he ex that he is trying to bring us into. 
Verse 3, he humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with the manner which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you, to do what? To teach you, to do what? To teach you that man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, right? Because prior to this experience, Israel believed, even in Egypt, that, well, as long as they could eat bread, leeks, and onions, they would survive. And so bread, leeks, and onions were their security, right? In modern day for us, that would be our jobs, our spouses, our whatever, our parents, right? Our ingenuity, our intelligence something that we have erected in our life as a God, something that we trust in wholeheartedly. And for most of us in the world, that is our jobs. And so when your money starts looking weird and your job starts is threatened or even taken away from you and you have to exist without one or you have to exist with a reduced pay or, or your bills are higher, then all of a sudden you begin to understand, oh, I'm not in a good place. I'm in a place of testing. The, the thing God is doing, I, I don't understand this. Why won't you just give me what I want? Why won't you give me what I understand? And so we are struggling with manna because it does not come in a form that we know, a form that we understand, a form that we have even ever seen. And so we struggle with it. But the purpose of the lesson is that God wants you to know that whatever you've built your life upon is not what is sustaining you. And for most of us, that is ourselves. We are our own gods, and that is pride. Our, our independence and self-sufficiency, trust in us, is what we our security is. And as long as we are in control or we believe we are in control, we feel secure. But when that control is ripped away from us, we begin to experience levels of fear that we didn't know was possible. But the wilderness is a place where God teaches you that you are not in control, God is in control, and your life is in God's hands, and God has got you. And so the wilderness is where you learn how to relinquish control of your life over to God and trust me especially for me it is one of the most difficult things that I could ever learn it is difficult to relinquish control of one's life you know we say I love you God you're the Lord of my life we say all of that yes but then we are tested on that saying that you you say that God is the Lord of your life and letting God and, and relinquishing control of your life completely to God are two very different experiences, trust me. <laughs> and so that's what the wilderness is. That's what it is when God is providing you with a manna. Is that God is showing you that the control of your life wasn't in your hands anyway. And that you live not because you were able to provide bread for yourself, because you have a job, because you have a spouse that is wealthy or you and your spouse both work and your income is wonderful or because your parents are providing for you or, or they always will right or family members or whatever it is or even because you won the lottery because we won the lottery does not mean that you are going to be able to survive it doesn't mean that you can win the lottery to the end and have a a, a, a medical defying um, uh, illness that only God can save you from. So you see, one of the things that we learn in our season of testing is that we are not in control. That the thing that we have built our life upon is not what keeps us alive. What keeps us alive is the Word of God. Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines the, his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Verse 6. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. Revering him. 
for the Lord your God is, verse 7, for the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey, a land, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. I said earlier to you that evidence to you that you are going to be a person of great wealth is that you must go through a season of lack and hunger, humility in your life. Because that pathway, that journey through a wilderness of lack, hunger, testing, or happiness is the pathway. It is the only way by which God will take you to the place of wealth. So be encouraged because you are simply walking out the journey to take you to the place of wealth. But unfortunately, as we walk this journey, we begin to lose sight of the big picture. We begin to, uh, our vision begins to get clouded. So now we're not able to see the forest because of the abundance of trees. When you see all these little tests, you, you become uh, on focus you lose sight of the big picture which is that I am leading you says God to a place of abundance but the road to a place of abundance is a road of lack a road of poverty a journey of unhappiness however your journey your sorrow will turn to joy in the name of jesus god is compassionate and kind and even though you don't see god in this know for a certainty that god is with you and god will not lie god does not lie god will not fail the place the promise he told you he is going to give you is exactly what he is doing. Manna is evidence, the provision that does not satisfy, the provision that makes you unhappy is evidence to you that you are in the right place. You are walking out the journey that is taking you to the place of abundance. Manna is evidence that that is what is happening in your life. If God has given you a promise of prosperity or an abundance and you have not yet walked through this place, this place of testing, this place of straight, this place of lack, I want you to know that you are not close to receiving your promise yet because the evidence to you that when you say, how will I know that I'm going to inherit this or how will I know that I am on the way and in the process of inheriting this abundance, this wealth, this great riches is because you begin to walk through this wilderness where there are serpents, scary things, scorpions, hunger, lack. That is how you know. Verse 10, when you have eaten and are satisfied, Praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you today. Verse 12. Otherwise, when you eat and you are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and your flocks grow large, and your silver and your gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, verse 14, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, right? So first of all, this is what I was saying. The wilderness removes from your life 
pride that is waiting for you in the land of promise. God already knows that human beings, we are lifted up in pride when we have an abundance of riches. That is why God will never ever give you riches without first stripping you of that spirit of pride within. And so God is doing you a favor, removing pride from your life before you get to the place where it will rise up out of you and destroy it. I know right now you say, what pride? What pride? I have nothing. What pride? Yes. You don't have the pride right now or the pride will show up but the the mind has a way of becoming corrupted in the abundance of wealth in the abundance of riches and that is why God says that when you have become abundant and rich and wealthy your heart will now be lifted up with pride and you will look at yourself and you will return to that place of self-sufficiency that place of self-trust self-reliance oh i did this for me i am this good in my ability i brought all this wealth into my life and so god must take you through this place first so that when you finally get to that place of abundance you remember who brought you here you remember the presence of god with you in the wilderness you remember that the control of your life was in the hand of god if it were not for god you would have died you remember that god gave you provision when there was lack that god supernaturally provided for you and so you didn't die not because because you provided for yourself or because you were self-sufficient or because you controlled all the aspects of your life you know for those of us that struggle with OCPD you know we have all our checklists we have all our uh, planning we plan years in advance we have a 30 years a 30 year plan we actually know what our funeral will look like we know how many people will be there we know what will be served I mean come on planners right <laughs> Right? So for those severe planners among us, those precision pe precise people, right? You plan everything, you control everything. <laughs> you know what every outcome is going to be. The wilderness is necessary so that God can rip out of your life those things that are going to destroy you when he finally gives you the promise. Anytime God gives you a promise, he must... He must humble you because the promises of God are so glorified and abundant that if our character has not been conformed to the image of God, the promise of God will cause us to self-destruct. Always. It always happens that way. So the issue is not the promise of God. The issue is the person, the character of you. And so God is doing you the work of a father by removing out of your character those things that will destroy you when you take possession. Right? Let me read that again in verse 13. It's uh, 12 and 13. It says, otherwise, when you eat and you are satisfied, when you build a fine houses and you settle down, and when your herds and your flocks grow large, and your silver and your gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud. Oh, Bush, come on. God has not forgot. God has not forgot. God did not forget you, babe. God did not forget. If he said that he would do it, no, it will come to pass. God didn't forget you. God has not forgotten you. God did not forget. So I know that because of where you are, it feels like God has abandoned you. God is not with me. God doesn't see me. All the sacrifices I made, where is God? The devil is a liar. You are on your way, babe. You are on your way. Woman of God, man of God, you were on your way. God didn't forget you. You are experiencing what you're experiencing because God wants to ensure that when you get 
when you possess his promise, it does not corrupt you. And so he must perfect your character. He must mature you. He must make you whole. And the wilderness is the only way to do it. Then your heart will become proud. And you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Out of the land of slavery. Verse 15. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land, and its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of a hard rock. What is God saying? You see, your wilderness is not going to be a good place. Oh, my shatter, come on. Your wilderness is going to be a dangerous place. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. The pathway to possessing the riches and glory of God means that you must walk through very, through very eerie places, places where you are certain you will die. Look at how God describes the wilderness, the place of testing that he has called you to walk through. It says that this place is vast. It means that it is so it is so big. It is like a sea, right? That is ununderstandable. You cannot comprehend it. Incomprehensible. It is dreadful. It will incite fear in you. It is a thirsty and waterless land, you will continually experience lack and parchment. You will constantly have a need in this place. You just want to have enough. Oh, Koboshe. But it is purposeful. Why? Because you are in the wilderness designed by God for you to walk through. Not only that, this is a place that has poisonous snakes and scorpions, meaning that Things that can kill you are present in this place. Oh, come on, come on. People that are destructive and have the ability, capacity to murder your life will exist with you in this place. You will be surrounded by murderous thieves, kobosha, lying demons, things that are able to consume your soul. You will see them in this place. That is what the wilderness is. The wilderness is not a place where you're prancing around happily. <laughs> that is not the wilderness. The wilderness is a place of extreme distress. Agonizing mental distress is what you're going to find there. It will elicit within you some dreadful emotions. You will feel a fear that you did not even know was possible. God's purpose is not to torment you with fear, but what I'm saying is that the presence of fear shows in your life and our lives that we have not yet been perfected in love. And so the wilderness, as we go through it, it begins to smoke to the surface all these things that God wants to get rid of out of our lives. Verse 16. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known, to humble and to test you so that it, so that in the end he might it might go well with you you may say to yourself my power and the strength of my hands have produced this world for me 18 but remember the lord your god for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and through that he confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. When you are unhappy with God's provision. Heavenly God, oh, your name is wonderful. Your name is excellent. Your name is beautiful. We worship you, God, for you are mighty. You've got the whole world. You've got the whole world. Come on. You've got the whole world in your 
hands in your hands. We bless you, Father. I thank you for this day. I thank you for your sons, the sons of God. I thank you for this work of the Father that you are doing in our lives. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for giving us eyes to see. I pray that you will strengthen each and every person with might in the inner man so that nobody will become discouraged as they walk through this wilderness because walking through the wilderness is the only way to get to the promise of abundance. Help none of us faint on the way, just as none of the Israelites fainted on the way except those that were punished. Help us not stop seeing. Help us not stop believing. But help us to be strengthened with faith within Holy Ghost. You are able to do it. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that is able to receive all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, perhaps you don't know this Jesus that I'm talking about today. Um, <laughs> Romans 10, verses 9 and 10 says that, Listen, to come into relationship with God is one of the best things you can ever do. And it is really easy. All you have to do is believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is real, that he did live as a human being on earth, and he allowed himself to be sacrificed on the cross so that his blood could be shed. It says that the only way for God to be able to make Payment for all your sin is to use the blood of somebody or something that was holy, holy, the holiest of all. And that was what Jesus was. That's why Jesus had to die. Right. And so now God requires you to acknowledge, to confess that God did give you the gift of your sins being forgiven through the death of Jesus Christ. You must believe that through and through in your heart. And if that is you today, and you believe that. I want you to repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you today asking you to forgive me for every sin. Lord Jesus, come into my life And be my Lord and my Savior. Lead me. Guide me. And make me your own. In Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer, you're officially born again. And I want to welcome you into the kingdom of God. Father, you see these who have given their lives to you today. I ask you to bring them to a Bible-based, Bible-believing church where they will be able to grow up in your love and your admonition. Keep them away from wolves that look like sheep. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining me today. I hope you are blessed by this message. Until we meet again this same time next week, stay blessed, remain encouraged, and may the grace of God be with you and keep us all. In Jesus' name, amen.